Aloha, how are you? Welcome to another show. We are, what are we, J&J Q&A? That's it. J&J Q&A. &J &A. And I, I think we stopped numbering them. We have, we still keep it a number, but because we're now exploring, we're in mid-double digits already of these shows. This is number 15. We're talking about the Urantia book and also... Many of you, if you look up U-R-A-N-T-I-A dot O-R-G, you'll see the Urantia book. You can actually get a copy. See this book? You really can't see it. You can get a hard copy. But if you'd like, and it has a DVD in it, actually an audio DVD. That's a good way to listen to it. You do a great job when you do it live on TV. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's a separate story. <laughs> Aloha. Welcome to show number we don't know of Q and A with J and J. Hello, hi everybody. <laughs> <laughs> We've been talking about the Urantia book, U R A N T I A dot org. Urantia. Right. Uh, Urantia means Earth, huh? Uh, that's the name of our planet. Oh, well, you know, we've been talking about it a while, and I've had a number of you out there who have said, "When are you going to do your live call-in talk show?" We are looking for good crew members. And uh, you're always welcome to join us. In the meantime, till we have a full crew and we're ready for production uh, and have call-in, uh, we're going to do more question and answers, just right. like this. Just like this. Until. Just between Jim and I. And right. today I had an unusual but usual event. <laughs> unusual in that it was done tastefully and very modestly and very naturally. Uh, I went to a funeral of a good friend of mine who just mm. passed away. And... Um, in fact, I use this camera. Rarely am I at the camera. I'm usually in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. But today, uh, this was a show with Adriana Grace, and it was a beautiful bunch of people that uh, were there honoring her in Makua. When I think about people passing from this world mm -hmm. to another world, mm -hmm. I'm sure that in the Arantia book, and just in, when I have conversation with you, you really opened my eyes to different ways of passing from here to there. Where we go from here. Where we go from here usually is probably mansion world number one. There are seven mansion worlds. They're called mansion worlds. Uh, they're resurrection worlds where, we, where people on the worlds of time and space resurrect in their new form. Uh, following their death on their planet. But the, the thought of a soul coming back to Earth in reincarnation? No. The soul goes forward by, by seraphic transport. By what? By seraphic transport, by angelic transport. Oh, seraphic, like uh -huh. angels. angels. Oh, I got it, okay. Oh, really? There are angels on death duty every day Angels carry the souls of the deceased to the mansion worlds for resurrection and the occupation of their new form. So the concept of reincarnation comes from... It's a misinformation. Just a... Mis it's been a long time uh, feeling by so many different religions of the world. A lot of people believe in reincarnation very sincerely. Even Willie Nelson, he really likes it. The so, the idea of mansion world to prepare our soul for reincarnation. Well, our soul, our soul is like an embryo, you might say. And and the the like, like our physical form was an embryo at one time, and now we're sitting in a fully developed human physical form. Well, now, the, 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 the soul inside you and I and everybody out there, all of you folks, your soul began its existence when you made your very first free will moral decision about five, six years old. And that very first choice you made is the time when your soul was born. At that point in time, a fragment of God's own spirit is called a thought, a thought adjuster. It's a fragment of the will of God. Well, that's quite a concept. A fragment of the, the will, will of God. God. Just like wow. just like 
your sperm is a fragment of your physical form, so to speak. The, the thought and gestures are the, uh, the essence of God. They are the highest form of reality in the universe. <laughs> wow, so. And so like, th that's who is the father of our soul. And we're actually co-partners in the creation of ourselves, our soul, from the time we make our first choice. That's the beginning of our eternal life, potentially. We can choose ourselves out of existence. <laughs> and it, not until you're five or six? What did you mean by that? that that's, mean? When, that's when the, the child has evolved enough physically and mentally to be able to recognize the difference between right and wrong, to be able to make a moral choice. I see, okay. <clears throat> so now you have a moral will creature at your service, so to speak. A baby, a new, a new baby with a new, you know, new soul. That's quite a, so every being in every, everywhere is a unique co-creation with God. Exactly. Through what you're calling yeah. a thought adjuster, sort of like your seraphim, your angelic, it's like an angel on your shoulder. It's the real you. It's the real you. Okay. It's now, how does Jesus come into this? Well, I mean, I'm just bring it in. His spirit enshrouds the developing, progressing soul of each person. The spirit of truth, the spirit of the Prince of Peace, enshrouds all of our souls. You can feel Jesus with your mind, with your soul. You know him with your mind. Well, <coughs> what's so fascinating is. And I, I hope that many of you appreciate, without, um, you know, some people think that if they read the Arantia book, oh my goodness, these ideas are counter their beliefs, etc., you know. Yeah. And in some ways, I think they complement. They're just progressive. They're, they're, they're progressive to the highest thought that's evolved on our planet since people have been here. <laughs> Well, you know, you talk like a scientist, and yet you talk I was a from, from a real in about what are defined that as religion. An interesting blend is here. You, how long have you been studying this now? 40, Decades. Forty-four years for the. Forty-four yeah. years. What I like about the book it unifies science and philosophy and truth, religion. Wow. See, I I think that. It, if it's not, cons the word religion is the thing that I wonder, because if it wasn't a religious book, it, just because something, for example, talks about Jesus, mm -hmm. why would a Jew or a Christian or anyone uh, not look at it as, how does this information relate to how I feel? Mm -hmm. And somehow, uh, as we go, I've had some people question and say, well, this isn't the Bible. Well, the Bible was book. This is another book. If you just take it at that, <laughs> yeah, don't identify it as some challenge to your beliefs. Although, you know, I mean, people believe what they choose to believe. Right? Well, exactly. That's, that's the problem. Well, See, you can choose to believe something's a fact and something's real when it isn't. Something that appears to be real may be an illusion instead of a fact. So, is it conceivable that someone can hear these facts mm -hmm. and take, they take them as an illusion and they go on their merry way? And some people will hear these facts and they will suddenly, it'll impact their life mm -hmm. to find out more and hopefully, I like the way you say that every seed Every spark that comes is enshrouded by the Prince of Peace. Every soul. Every soul. Is enshrouded with the Spirit of Truth, the Spirit of the Prince of Peace. That's a very powerful message. <laughs> you know, the Prince of what? Peace. 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 <laughs> Peace. Peace and love. Yeah, you know. It's I based mean, on truth and justice. 
Yeah, and Superman would say, and the American way, oh, <laughs> Superman. <laughs> but Kryptonite got him. Yeah, big time. The truth and justice. Um, when, if, if I said the word passing to another world, or mm -hmm. uh, the other places where that kind of thing is discussed in, no, in yeah, the page, page 530. It's titled The Seven Mansion Worlds. I don't know if the page will be right in your version, but let me see. What, what is this? What uh, paper is this? Paper number 47. Paper 47. You know, it's interesting. We've been in a couple of these uh, books before, in different parts of these books before. Mm -hmm. This is right where? At the near the beginning. Yeah, this is the, the beginning of The Seven Mansion Worlds. Uh, it says, The Creator's Son. When on Urantia, that's Jesus, spoke of the many mansions in the Father's universe. Jesus said, in my Father's house is many mansions. Okay. In a certain sense, all 56 of the encircling worlds of Jerusalem, that's the capital of our local system of worlds. Okay. In a certain sense, all 56 of the, of the encircling worlds of Jerusalem are devoted to the transitional culture of ascending mortals. But the seven satellites of world number one are more specifically known as the mansion worlds. On the first mansion world, all survivors must pass the requirements of the parental commission from their native planets. <laughs> the present Urantia commission consists of 12 parental couples recently arrived who have had mortal experience in rearing three or more children to the pubescent age. Service on this commission is rotational and is for only 10 years as a rule. <laughs> I'm, I'm having trouble understanding exactly what that means. But well, it's okay. All who fail to satisfy these commissioners as to their parental experience must further qualify by service in the home of the material sons of Jerusalem, those are the Adams and Eves, or in part in the probationary nursery on the finaliter's world. This is where the little infants uh, are resurrected in their physical forms. If they, if they were, um, if they died for one reason or another before they made their first moral choice, the, 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 the person, the, 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 there's no soul, but the person, the, the, little, the little one resurrects on, the, on this probationary nursery. At the same time, the parents, one or more of the parents, uh, resurrect after the, at the end of their life. Hmm. So then it grows up on, the, on this little probationary world until it makes its first choice. <laughs> wow. And then, That's a lot to think about. Okay. But irrespective of parental experience, mansion world parents who have growing children in the, probationary, in the probation nursery are given every opportunity to collaborate with the Morancha custodians of such children regarding their instruction and training. These parents are permitted to journey there for visits as often as four times a year, and it is one of the most touchingly beautiful scenes of all the ascending career to observe the mansion world parents embrace their material offspring on the occasions of their periodic pilgrimages to the finality world. What's Marantia? Marantia is what our soul is. Our soul is, is made of super physical and sub-spiritual energies known as Marantia material. This is, this is physical energy. Our soul is Marantia energy. Okay. Like it's a synthesis, a blend of physical and spiritual. So it's an in-between kind of thing. <laughs> wow. And uh, can it be sensed by people in the physical world? No, you can't say. There's no physical measurement for the soul. But everybody knows he has a soul. <laughs> so when people feel they have an experience with um, someone that's passed on, what is that? 
That's just a misinterpretation or a misunderstanding of an experience. You, here's the thing, the problem with free will is, when it comes to defining experience, you either tell it the way it is, or you tell it the way it isn't. Okay. okay. And you can look at something and see it black and white and broad and clear, and not even know what you're looking at. If you listen to the interpretations of what some people think they're looking at. Well, it's interesting. You know, we, yeah. we everything is part of our experience, so. Exactly. It's, it's interesting. So it's easy to misinterpret or misunderstand anything. <laughs> but the bottom line is, peace? What's the bottom line? Is there such a thing as a bottom line? Yeah, the bottom line is peace on earth and goodwill among everybody. As far as world peace is concerned, the, the bottom line for world peace is uh, uh, goodwill among everybody. Wouldn't that be a nice, refreshing thing? <laughs> I guess it takes a uh, personal, we all have to, you and me, you, all have to come from that place and bring peace into everything that we do. Right, exactly. Yeah. Well, peacemakers, we're sons of the Prince of Peace, so peacemaking, uh, I consider myself a peacemaker. <laughs> Trying to help create world peace. And you've been, you've been sharing this message live and um, for many years yeah. with, with people. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say that you have uh, uh, seen a new kind of foundation? I, I see around you people that are very passionate about wanting to share this message out there. Right. Well, it's a thrilling discovery to, to find. Discovering this Rancho book is like discovering Jesus in his day and age. Oh, wow. Because this book is an epical revelation of knowledge and wisdom and truth about God and the universe. So that's why when you said that the second coming, if you will, of Jesus, mm -hmm. you know, of Michael of Nebadon, mm -hmm. yeah. Michael of Nebadon as Jesus, yeah. is uh, this epic revelation that we all are uniquely and part of this second phase of taking action of the words that were spoken the first time that was stopped when Jesus was ended, right? Because he never continued. I guess, I think, he well, never... He, got... he, he has continued, but not as Jesus. <laughs> the... the the great thing about the death of Jesus, the great <clears throat> thing about the death of Jesus is that it made possible the bestowal of the spirit of truth and the thought of justice on all the people of the world. It made it possible It made because... it possible because he was the bestowal son who came here two ages ahead of time to try to do as much as he could to bring an end to the planetary rebellion on our world and, the, and that had scattered to other areas in his universe, in our local system of worlds. Our world leader, our spiritual leader, went into rebellion on this planet 200,000 years ago, along with 36 other planetary princes. And our local system of worlds has been quarantined, isolated, and, and uh, uh, for 200,000 years, we've been in a very unusual environmental situation. So we're born into it, and we don't know anything about these things of the past until this book reveals all these things about the past. I see. That's Our history. Sweet. Our history so makes this is fun. the key to reconnect to a history beyond what is understood in this universe. Before we started as human beings recording history, there was hundreds of thousands of years of history evolving. <laughs> and of course, we, we know nothing about that other than what we've been able to piece together bit by bit through scientific research and discovery. Well, you know, 
There's so much here. Every time, every time we do this, I think to myself, I'm going to ask questions about the book because the book is, is really a huge, huge document. And it's, it came, you've heard through all the shows, to us through a group of people that got together. And it was, what, channeled or not well, really channeled? I don't say channeled. It was, um, I don't know how it was transmitted. There was a, there was a contact personality involved. And <clears throat> that contact personality uh, was unconscious during the entire period of time it took for him to be used, for his body to be used uh, as the as the vehicle as to the communicate vehicle, this. As the enabler, so to speak. Hmm. His natural state of, of, I don't know what to call it, a mental problem or difficulty was, he first came to Dr. Sadler uh, for a problem with his uh, living. He, he, he would, his wife would find him sound asleep and couldn't wake him up. Oh. If he had an appointment or something, he had to wait for She couldn't wake him up. And, and, and he'd finally come to, and everything get normal, and so forth and so on. So he's, every once in a while we have these so-called spells. And he went from doctor to doctor, and psychologist to psychiatrist, and finally he ended up with Dr. Sadler, who was the top of the psychiatric uh, profession in the, in the 20s. In the, uh, early, early, early part of the 1900s and the, in the 20s and 30s. So, okay. So uh, this uh, this patient of Dr. Sandler's turned out to be the contact personality. The book refers to this person as the contact personality. Oh. Now, uh, in 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 these contacts that were taking place. He didn't know it, and of course we wouldn't know it, except it's been revealed in here, yeah. that at the time of these revelations were, were transmitted, his thought adjuster would remove itself from the citadel of the mind of that person. He'd take the thought adjuster, get back off to the side, and a secondary midwayer would occupy that place. And that secondary midwayer could communicate, just like we're talking, from the spiritual side of the universe to the physical side of the universe, because they're capable of doing that. So would you and call well, midwayer an angel? No, a midwayer is not an angel. A midwayer is a very unique creature. Yeah, it's a very part of it's a very interesting part of, of our history. Because the midwayers, have, it turns out, they are the permanent citizens of our world. Since their origin, they have become the permanent citizens of our planet. <laughs> so they're part of our superhuman planetary government. They work with the angels. And they have special messengers on special missions because they are special creatures. How come, how come our world can get to the point where it is now? Free will? Free will. It's all about free will. Everything's a matter of choice. Now, everybody knows, everybody's made enough mistakes to know it's like stubbing your toe. <laughs> you stub your toe enough, you know, you, you know. There's certain, you soon, soon get an understanding of cause and effect. You start being a little more careful. So, Free will is power, it's, it's God power. It's, God has given us not only liberty and freedom, but his power, freedom, volition, is will. And will is God power, it's not energy, it's power that transmutes the forms of energy into other uh, manifestations of reality. Wow, that's a mouthful. So, the power to choose, the power to create, 
It can, you, you can create or you can destroy. Right. The purpose of, of those people who are the leaders of those who are going against the will of God on earth, uh, they're taking everybody uh, to the worst of all possible places in terms of survival. <laughs> and the opposite is, of course, heaven on earth. So these are both matters of choice. We either have heaven on earth or hell on earth. We either have group survival or group extinction. So this, was that because of the rebellion? It's all matters of choice. It's, it's yeah. the outworking of the will of man in absence of any visible spiritual rulers. Well, that's a powerful little piece there. Man acting in absence of awareness of a spiritual ruler. Right. How does that spiritual ruler take control? He doesn't. He, he co-creates with us, right? He's our partner. He's our silent partner, so to speak. And, and, and does everything possible to make the most of, of our lives and our situations. So, does his part to make this a beautiful world. Mm, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Helps us with our thinking, choosing. And that's and why it's revelations. Michael. We have revelations. God reveals thoughts to us, truths to us. So, Michael, I'm using the way back and just sort of mm -hmm. circling the idea back. Yeah. So, Michael of Nabadon, mm -hmm. the Prince of Peace, right. is here because God uh, had this, tr this truth of. The universe and Michael was his emissary to earth mm -hmm. Urantia. He's the revelation of God to our planet and the rest of the planets of his universe. He's a, he's a living revelation of the infinite. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't that excite? That should excite everybody. But, um, some people say, no, it was Mohammed. No, it was Buddha. <laughs> I think that um, that's a really powerful thing. And yeah. What's powerful when I'm talking to you is I'm constantly, I'm reaching, I'm waiting for the day when these people can start to ask questions. Right, that would be so much fun. Because I go, I'm going around to try to grab the concept and try to see that this book, I look at this book not as religious. No. I look at it as informational, foundational for creation of whatever that essence in me says, peace, goodwill, mm -hmm. cooperation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I look forward to that. I look forward to you asking questions and mm -hmm. having your comments. Um, yeah, I think that uh, this is going to grow into, I think it's already doing it, but it will grow more into study groups where yeah. people will Sure. study different parts of this yes. to try to analyze it and integrate it into other cultures and beliefs. That's kind of what we're doing here in a way. Uh, you know, uh, we're, we're discussing thoughts and concepts in it and as you discover uh, things or, or want to know something about something that is in here. And, and it's a wonderful experience for people to share because uh, learning is is thrilling, it's fun, it's exciting, and uh, so we could we could have a, we could we could do a, a, a class on on TV live. That'd be good. It'd be easy. I mean, we could we could read some sections or any section, whatever section you folks want to read. I want to know something about it, and we can read it and talk about it, and hey, that's, <laughs> and that's uh, really. I think so. I think it'd be a, a real good step. It's going to be an interesting step when we all can embrace some of you field production people already know. Having conversations like this and doing things in the field that can then go through the internet, because local TV, which is a cable, Right? Mm -hmm. Station. At some point, this, the, the real concept of viral is so much more powerful on the internet yeah. than on a local right. level. Right. So we're going to have call-in talk shows, 
on the internet. I mean, they have right. they call them webinars. Now. Webinars. Okay. They have new names. So good. You know, All right. conference know. calls and webinars. Cool. <laughs> Sounds like fun. <laughs> well, that's sort of like call-in talk show. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Right. And I'm really excited about the fact that we're going to do them down here at Akaku at oh, yeah. our local Maui yeah. television. For sure. Um, yeah. um, we've gone off in, in lots of different directions. Um, I think that um, there's a part that you wanted to share uh, about uh, the different ways, uh, you know, I brought it into reincarnation and asked you, and you, you mentioned a lot of invalidations of things that people believe, and they, it's not the invalidations, it's more like they believe what they believe. Whether it's true or not, You have a, your truth is that it isn't. True. Well, reincarnation is not a fact. It's okay. not a fact of universe reality. It's a belief. And there's no way scientifically you can demonstrate or prove or disprove it because it, it, it's, it's not a fact. I see. So that's where science and that idea... Science is superstition. Are, are, are dependent on science. Is deal, science deals with facts, and superstition deal, deals with beliefs. Okay. Like Santa Claus is a good example of superstition. There is no Santa Claus, but uh, millions of people believe there is. Really? Yeah. <laughs> that guy. That guy. <laughs> Thought Santa was real, nice yeah, and just like um, there's true and false religion, and this is what creates problems. These the the, the reality of free will uh, and the circumstances of living and the locations of where we're born and raised all determine all kinds of things having to do with true or false religion. <laughs> well, and, and I think that it's how heavily that people get into that dogma and create action creates non-peace, non if you will. Oh yeah, well, non you, you, get will. Just, you get just what you choose, and, and <laughs> if you choose the wrong thoughts, they won't take you to the right location or a peaceful conclusion. You might take you around in circles so you catch the real thing on the second time around. <laughs> How do you direct your thoughts? Do you direct your thoughts or you let them flow? Direct my thoughts? Well, you know, when you're talking about if you take a thought and you take it a certain way, you get a, you, you uh, don't get the conclusion that you want to get. So, do you direct your thoughts or you just let them flow? I just follow the thinking, follow the thoughts. It's like, where they take me? <laughs> okay. It's like, you ask a question, you get an answer, and, and the consequence is you start writing about the conclusions of what you've learned as a consequence of asking and receiving. You ask a question, you get an answer, oh, for us. That, <laughs> that gives you fuel for another question. And another question, and another question. So, <clears throat> fuel for thought comes from learning uh, things that you didn't know about. And uh, the more you learn, the more you want to learn. It's how it was with me, anyhow. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't stop learning until I discovered God. Wow. Literally. <laughs> I, I think it's interesting that you talk about you started as someone who was brought up religion and you went atheist and then you went back to religion in a totally new and invigorating way. Whole different, whole different level of reality. From a, that's an, from a scientist. That, yeah. That to me is really powerful. Yeah. Are there many people who have been studying for years like you? Not many that I no. obviously don't know. There's a, there aren't that many. There's, there's an, 
There aren't that many people that have discovered the book yet on a worldwide level. Uh, although there are, it, it is growing increasingly. Uh, and, and there's a lot of people that have been dedicated to the reading and dissemination of the book as much as they can for a long time, too. So we just need more. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I wonder, we've talked about that there are sections that Hollywood would uh, really find very uh, drama-packed. Any, any dramas in here that you think might be a good movie? Oh, my God. This book is loaded with potential movies. I mean, it's phenomenal. There are more movies in here of, of the greatest quality possible than have ever been made, as far as I can see. It goes from science to drama to philosophy to religion. I mean, the, the, the topics and the, and the subject matter involved, it's just phenomenal. It's just phenomenal. The phenomenon of death. <laughs> This is, a, this is a paper titled Personality Survival. What paper number? Just paper see. number 112. 112, okay. This is the last of five, five papers about thought adjusters. Okay. <laughs> but this deals with the phenomenon of death. Urantians generally recognize only one kind of death the physical cessation of life energies. But concerning personality survival, there are really three kinds. <laughs> First, spiritual, soul death. If and when mortal man has finally rejected survival, when he has been pronounced spiritually insolvent, morontially bankrupt, in the conjoint opinion of the thought adjuster and the surviving angel, when such coordinate advice has been recorded on Uversa and after the censors and their reflective associates have verified these findings, thereupon do the rulers of Orvantan order the immediate release of the indwelling monitor. But this release of the adjuster in no way affects the duties of the personal or group seraphim concerned with that adjuster abandoned individual. Um, this kind of death is final in its significance, irrespective of the temporary continuation of the living energies of the physical and mind mechanisms. You may be spiritually dead and physically alive still. Sort of zombies. <laughs> yeah. From the cosmic standpoint, the mortal is already dead. The continuing life merely indicates the persistence of the material momentum of cosmic energies. The persistence of material momentum. Of cosmic energies. What? Amazing <laughs> words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this was from a patient of Dr. Sadler? Well, he, he was just the person through whom this information was passed. Those are, pa listen, that grouping of words. Yeah. Like, yeah. In one sentence, it's a concept is so huge. Yeah. Continue. Please. Now the second, number two, intellectual or mind death. When the vital circuits of higher adjutant ministry are disrupted through the aberrations of intellect or because of the partial destruction of the mechanism of the brain, and if these conditions pass a certain critical point of irreparability, the indwelling adjuster is immediately released to depart for Divinington. That's the world of his origin. On the universe records, a mortal personality is considered to have met with death whenever the essential mind circuits of human will action have been destroyed. And again, this is death, irrespective of the continuing function of the living mechanism 
of the physical body. <laughs> the body minus the volitional mind is no longer human. So that sounds a lot like the first type. So what's different about this second type then? The body minus the volitional mind is no longer human, but according to the prior choosing of the human will, the soul of such an individual may survive. That's the difference. The spiritual death, there's no survival after death. Down and up, river, no hell. Thank God there's no hell. <laughs> you either make it or you don't. The third kind of death is physical death. Like like happened today. With like body the and mind. The body and mind, everything goes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> when death overtakes a human being, the adjuster remains in the citadel of the mind until it ceases to function as an intelligent mechanism. About the time that the measurable brain energies cease their rhythmic vital pulsations. Following this dissolution, the adjuster takes leave of the vanishing mind just as unceremoniously as entry was made years before and proceeds to Divinington by way of Uversa. <laughs> <laughs> so, proceeds uh, energetically, I guess it means. Right? Personally, to Divinington, which is another world, another realm. Mm -hmm. And what's Uversa? Uversa is the capital of our super universe, or Vampire. So now, so that's the physical and physical and mental, is that what we said? Physical, physical and mental physical divine? And body and, and body mind. Body and mind. Yeah, physical and body. Body okay. and mind. So that soul <clears throat> is still here. The soul, well, the soul, we were talking about that earlier, right? The soul is transported to the mansion world for resurrection. <laughs> Personal, special delivery. <laughs> I guess, you know, you've gone over it so many times, it flows. I'm still reaching to understand yeah. it. Yeah. I look forward to your questions, because maybe some of you of it can explain it. And maybe show me. Uh, I'm, I'm most intrigued by that one. Well, uh, after death, the material body returns to the el elemental world from which it was derived. Right. But two non-material factors of surviving personality persist. The pre-existent thought adjuster. <laughs> right. With the memory transcription of the mortal career. <laughs> well, that's what we've got. These are called careers. The, mortal, the memory transcription bra of our life. Wow. Can you dig it? It's like having it on a memory <laughs> stick. Yeah. Yeah. Is it? Is it? Wow. So the will of God proceeds to Divinity and there also remains in the custody of the destiny guardian, the guardian angel, the immortal Marancha soul of the deceased human. These phases and forms of soul, these once kinetic but now static formulas of identity are essential to repersonalization on the Marancha worlds. And it is the and it, and it is the reunion of the thought adjuster and the soul that reassembles the surviving personality. Wow. That reconsciousizes you at the time of the Marancha awakening. Wow. <laughs> this, that's a big mouthful. <laughs> so, the thought adjuster and the soul right. come together. The Marancha, what was the last words? Marancha? The Marancha awakening. You're in another world. You're waking up. We, you go to, you die, and it's like going to sleep. You go to sleep on this world, you wake up on another world. Not only are the are you the same you, but hey, I'm in a new form. I got a whole new body. Super, super physical. 
<laughs> Just like the form Jesus had after his resurrection. For the 40 days he was here after his death and resurrection, he was living and breathing and, and working in his soul form. And now, does everyone have this experience and we just don't? Those who survive all wake up in a new form. Right, but they aren't always perceived. Is that what people who perceive uh, experiences after death with that person is that? Could uh, that be considered that? that? No. I'm trying to understand. <laughs> See, if, you, if, if there's someone here for 40 days, like in Jesus' case, with a new form, and someone has feelings, could that be understood as that? That the presence of someone is still physically? No, 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 no. That would, that would not be nothing like that. No. Uh, for, the, for, for the main reason, Jesus is the only person for whom it was possible for anybody to stay here after they were dead. <laughs> he just happened to be the creator of the universe, incarnate. Oh, he had special so powers. He had, he had daddy, he has daddy, he's a daddy. If I can hang out here for a little while afterwards, then I can dig him. So he got 40 days. Oh. <laughs> I was just trying to... And he made, all, he made 18 appearances after his death and resurrection. And, the, and that was all done on this world, which ordinarily goes down on the mansion worlds. Yeah. They brought the mansion world realities here so he could experience the Marantia career while still here, instead of going there to experience it. Because he wanted to, he wanted to reappear to the apostles from time to time to help them, you know, to get their thing. Wow, that one's a really an interesting one. <laughs> so, the, that's, the, that is really, what we've been talking about today is really uh, gigantic, gigantic and interesting truths that you you're opening up here. I wonder, have these things, I wonder how and they might be explained to allow someone's perception of truth as reality. I'm trying to Well, we have the spirit of truth that helps us recognize truth wherever it comes from. Because any our thought, of, our, our spirit of truth wants us to discover all the facts and truth we can discover because the more we know, the more we can understand. The more we can understand, the more we can do. So forth and so on. Okay. <laughs> Section five, survival of the human self. Selfhood is a cosmic reality, whether material, moral, or spiritual. The actuality of the personal is the bestowal of the Universal Father acting in and of himself or through his manifold universe agencies. To say that a being is personal is to recognize the relative individuation of such a being within the cosmic organism. <laughs> the living cosmos is an all but infinitely integrated aggregation of real units, all of which are relatively subject to the destiny of the whole. <laughs> but those that are personal have been endowed with the actual choice of destiny acceptance or of destiny rejection. <laughs> Everything's a matter of choice. That's, yeah, back to that. That which comes from the Father is like the Father eternal. And this is just as true of personality, which God gives by his own free will choice, as it is of the divine thought adjuster, an actual fragment of God. Man's personality is eternal but with regard to identity, a conditioned eternal reality. Having appeared in response to the Father's will, personality will attain deity destiny, 
but man must choose whether or not he will be present at the attainment of such destiny. <laughs> In default of such choice, Personality attains experiential deity directly, becoming a part of the Supreme Being. The cycle is foreordained, but man's participation therein is optional, personal, and experiential. <laughs> so, uh, I was just going to ask for odds, but, but what is it going to take to have man's choice be directed toward peace? You know, where is that balance? You know, what I mean. Well, the problem, the problem, as I see it, is it evolves out of the fact that our 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 problem is a communications problem. And without a budget, you can't really communicate very far beyond uh, the range of letters to the editor or local access TV or email or whatever. But until, until we can get the kind of time on television that these Christian preachers have, uh, it's going to go slow because the people have never heard about it. It's never this been. is a lot for them to grasp. A lot to be grasped. Which is why I think, you know, when we're doing the mm -hmm. call-in talk show, we may discover, I mean, mm -hmm. I recognize that the questions sometimes that I'm asking, I'm trying to put together large concepts, but this is a lot <laughs> of stuff here. A lot of stuff. Yeah. For people to get. So, yeah. I can hear myself as we're going through these shows, repeating myself and asking questions yeah. in different ways. Um, you want to continue? Yeah, mortal identity is a transient time-life condition in the universe. Okay. It is real only insofar as the personality elects to become a continuing universe phenomenon. <laughs> This is the essential difference between man and an energy system. The energy system must continue. It has no choice. <laughs> but man has everything to do with determining his own destiny. The adjuster is truly the path to paradise. <laughs> But man himself must pursue that path by his own deciding, his own free will choosing. And the cooperation of others in this free will world, right? That's the idea. Once everybody knows the basics about themselves, hey, then we can begin to operate as a, as a unified whole instead of a completely divided uh, disintegrated uh, body of humanity. So who is it out there that we are hoping will hoping will, that we expect will see this and be able to affect uh, more communication and come from this place that we're coming from? How do we who yeah, do we reach? Well, who do we, who are we it, looking for? We're looking for anybody who's got enough money to finance a, a, a program like ours on a larger station than Akaku. I don't know what it costs, but it costs big bucks. Uh, and uh, But for us to be able to, to, to develop our show to the point that it can serve the people like you and others uh, to a much uh, greater degree than we're capable of doing now, it takes a budget of some uh, amount. Like when Linda Lingle ran for the U.S. Senate, she had her own TV station <laughs> right between uh, CNN and Fox News. So you couldn't help but come across her uh, TV ad because uh, she had her own channel. Well, we don't have a channel other than this wonderful channel of Kaku. And... Uh, 
And we, if we can talk to you, we, potentially we can talk to the world, but we need communications that transcend the potentials of what we're presently using. Well, you know, that's, that's the thing that I face in the business I'm working in now is the awareness that the Akaku, uh, and it's now turning into digital, but it has choices for us as producers, for example, yeah. digitally, because the wave of the future is going yeah. to be call-in, talk show, and choices, and internet-based. Yeah. That the delivery of communication is now switching from these analog models and whatever, cables, whatever, to something that is got infinite choice. I mean, a, a practical... A lot more potential. Well, a lot more potential, but again, how do we deliver that message most widely? The, the way that communication happens. We can have, we can have this where it's broken down and we do shows. <laughs> A lot of the money that you're talking about raising isn't for the conventional television station. It's more for the way of delivering this message through this digital tool. I mean, camera like this, we're sitting here like this, <coughs> I think we've shared. On an iPhone, you can have the same quality video delivered directly up and whatever. So the question is, how do we get the message? That's where that money comes. You know, when we think of money, we think of where it goes to. Mm -hmm. When in fact, hopefully someone that's giving it, or you know, everyone that recognizes the power and value of what we're doing, we're creating lots of jobs that really are in sync with what's going on around us. Yeah, true. We're thinking, I, I found it funny, but when we're looking at an akaku, the, the, the people that find us on a digital station on akaku in a cable, many, many, many more people are finding they don't go to the local cable at all now. They use this internet right. as their as their television, if you yeah, will, communication as their communication central. central. Yeah, yeah. So that's the direction that I think that some of this money, I mean, yeah. I mean our yeah. money for us to survive is not very much, we're talking relative to where this money will be spent and regenerating yeah. Yeah. and uh, being able to share. I think yeah. a, that's a very powerful thing to be talking yeah, to, about. To be able to share this information with people, uh, is that's the paramount. And creating jobs. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I'm looking at the physical yeah. world yeah, and sure. what it means. Just because when someone thinks about contributing to what we're doing, right. the yeah. call-in talk show at the moment is taking a form of what we're doing on a physical television station. Right. Right. But right. The, the thing that we're doing with our communication is more global. Right. So we entrust right now is what we're doing. We're entrusting an Akaku, and we'll be doing call-in talk shows there right. as an incubator for monies or mm -hmm. sponsors, however we want right. to describe it. Yeah. People, angels, <laughs> well, angels, but they could also be sponsors. You yeah, know, I mean, because as they, as they in this new media somehow plug into, <clears throat> for example, they may be getting ad space next to our uh, shows that are on the net right. and the money is being spent in a totally different way than you and I might have originally conceived <laughs> it would be spent. Amazing. It's amazing. It's just like the, the way uh, people can do editing. Editing used to be with tape, remember that? Right, right, right. And now things, people, <laughs> I remember someone was telling me, a camera guy yesterday, who was a professional photographer, had these Hasselblad lenses, which were very, very, very expensive. And the digital age just completely made them, I would, they're interesting collector's items, yeah. but they've been way outpaced <laughs> by technology. So I bring that up to anyone that might be considering you know, being part of what we're doing sure, here. Sure. There are a lot of ways that you can do it and be part of this techno world. Really? Yeah. So please appreciate that. I, I would like to continue what you were talking about, see if we can 
come to get a handle on it. You were talking about the third way of the third way the third, of death. The three types of dying, three death. types of death. Right. So what happened today was a physical death. Yeah, yes. Physical, physical death. and mind. mind. Body and mind. <clears throat> so to that person uh, is being transported. The soul of that person is being transported as we speak to the mansion world number one. And it takes about three days to get there. Three days, okay. It takes about the same amount of time as it took for Jesus to resurrect after his death. Okay. And, 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 and the soul is transported. You'll be traveling at three times the speed of light <laughs> by seraphic, angelic transport. Wow. <laughs> so, those... I'm, I'm off on a tangent again. Those three days are powerful days. Oh. Well, you don't, you don't know anything about it. You're completely unconscious. There's no... Well, the sleep of death is... is uh, uh, you're completely unconscious of anything and everything. It's like this last Sunday we read about the resurrection of Lazarus. Mm -hmm. And he had been dead four days by the time he was resurrected. And he had absolutely no concept of the four days he had been in the grave. <laughs> he woke up, he, he came to, woke up, sat up on the edge of his grave thing with bandages hanging off of him. What's going on? <laughs> Well, that's, that's, that wasn't really, that was, was that death? He, he, he experienced complete death. This is the, this is the most incredible of all the manifestations of, of the divine power of Jesus, uh, was the resurrection of Lazarus. It was his last attempt to save the Jewish leadership from their plans of rejecting him. Wow. And finally, and accepting him. I'm sure I'm gonna find that in here somewhere. Wow. Oh, so, uh, yeah. so Lazarus was a Jewish guy. Yeah, Lazarus was a Jewish guy. And he passed away, and, wow. Yeah. I can see where you say that's like the last attempt. That's because that's quite a feat. Oh, phenomenal! <laughs> phenomenal. Uh, here's the resurrection of Lazarus. We talked about some interesting things. We talked about the power of Jesus as Michael of Nevedon mm -hmm. to stay on Earth after his physical death mm -hmm. and mind death. Mm -hmm. Instead of going to the mansion world, aren't these great stories? I think we've seen some of them. <laughs> maybe some of them. Maybe we have. But um, uh, please continue, because you were talking just now about. And so on this Thursday afternoon, at about half past two o'clock, was the stage all set in this little hamlet of Bethany for the enactment of the greatest of all works connected with the earth ministry of Michael of Nevedon, the greatest manifestation of divine power during his incarnation in the flesh, since his own resurrection occurred after he had been liberated from the bonds of mortal habitation. <laughs> He's the greatest. <laughs> That's what we were just talking about. Okay. <laughs> The small group assembled before Lazarus' tomb little realized the presence near at hand of a vast concourse of all orders of celestial beings assembled under the leadership of Gabriel and now in waiting by direction of the personalized thought adjuster of Jesus, vibrating with expectancy and ready to execute the bidding of their beloved sovereign. <laughs> Those are great words. When Jesus spoke those words of command, take away the stone, 
the assembled celestial hosts made ready to enact the drama of the resurrection of Lazarus in the likeness of his mortal flesh. Such a form of resurrection involves difficulties of execution which far transcend the usual technique of the resurrection of mortal creatures in Marancha form and requires far more celestial personalities and a far greater organization of universe facilities. I would think so. <laughs> really? <laughs> I mean, it's like four days is a decaying, yeah, bloated body. Yeah, yeah. When Martha and Mary heard this command of Jesus, directing that the stone in front of the tomb be rolled away, they were filled with conflicting emotions. Mary hoped that Lazarus was to be raised from the dead, but Martha, while to some extent sharing her sister's faith, was more exercised by the fear that Lazarus would not be presentable in his appearance. That's what I was just thinking. <laughs> to Jesus, the apostles, and their friends, said Martha, must we roll away the stone? My brother has now been dead four days, so that by this time decay of the body has begun. Yeah. Martha also said this because she was not certain as to why the master had requested that the stone be removed. She thought maybe Jesus wanted only to take one last look at Lazarus. <laughs> she was not settled and constant in her attitude. As they hesitated to roll away the stone, Jesus said, Did I not tell you at the first that this sickness was not to the death? Have I not come to fulfill my promise? And after I came to you, did I not say that if you would only believe, you should see the glory of God? <laughs> Wherefore do you doubt how long before you will believe and obey? When Jesus had finished speaking, his apostles, with the assistance of willing neighbors, laid hold upon the stone and rolled it away from the entrance to the tomb. It was the common belief of the Jews that the drop of gall on the point of the sword of the angel of death <laughs> began to work by the end of the third day, so that it was taking full effect on the fourth day. They allowed that the soul of man might linger about the tomb until the end of the third day, seeking to reanimate the dead body. <laughs> But they firmly believed that such a soul had gone on to the abode of departed spirits ere the fourth day had dawned. These beliefs and opinions regarding the dead and the departure of the spirits of the dead served to make sure in the minds of all who were not present at Lazarus's tomb and subsequently to all who might hear of what was about to occur that this was really and truly a case of the raising of the dead by the personal working of one who declared he was the resurrection and the life. <laughs> well, I mean, I, as we listen to that, you know, the, if we choose to believe it as truth, right? Mm -hmm. Just the scope of that is... It's so astounding. It's astonishing. It's, it's phenomenal, truly. See, when I when I look at this and I, I think about how many concepts there are for people to grasp, I, I wonder who out who out there. What is our bottom line? I think our bottom line is exposing all this, and at least my bottom line is to bring us closer to peace. Yeah. Encourage your, so, you know, brothers, we're brothers and sisters. We want to stimulate your appetite for peace and knowledge and wisdom and truth. <laughs> well, I mean, because to me... Because we want world peace. I, I mean, that's what the interaction's going to do, hopefully. Yeah. We'll all start to realize that we ourselves can take that step toward peace. You know, uh, I don't know why I go back to the John Lennon thing. I guess because it just hits me. Good. Imagine there's no countries. There's no separation. No reason to kill or die. You know, we can all share. This thing about religions and whatever happened, and it's all very interesting, but 
the bottom line is, what are we trying to affect? We're trying to get more people exposed to things to get them in a place of peace. That's a beautiful yeah, sure. conclusion. Well, peace is a spiritual fruit, and it comes from your direct connection with the spirit of truth. You're, 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 the, 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 the peace of Jesus, the peace of the Prince of Peace, is comes to you directly from the spirit of truth within you. So. Well, I think we've, we've talked a lot today. I think that um, I would like to see uh, up on credits somewhere, well, I think we should just at least tell you, you can get a, a book, um, U-R-A-N-T-I-A, Urantia.org, and read it online. You can get a physical book. You can get discs and audio. Uh, but I think our discussions and the input of our audience mm -hmm. is going to be probably the, the yeah. greatest part. Yeah, for sure. Because we may just be flying. We sound like uh, a scientist and some <laughs> thinks he's a philosopher guy. <laughs> and I'm trying to put it all together. But um, I'd like to get you all involved because we are now opening up a subject that, um, uh, what do they say? can go viral. That would be nice to go viral. Go viral. Things that lead us peaceward. Yeah. <laughs> Bring us closer and find peace. Peace in our world. Thank you for spending the time with me today. It's really it's been a pleasure. pleasure once again. Thank, Thank you. you very much. <laughs> I'm not counting anymore. I really, I know you're counting. But <coughs> Q&A, J&J, and &J, Q and a and soon to be live call in. Uh, I'm very excited. I hope that you're as excited as we are. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining me, Jim. A lot Jeff. of fun. Much aloha. Aloha.